was. No matter what I did, I couldn't get angry. Um, I really think there's been a sea change in the archetype of a person, you know, in the 50s and 60s that was, you know, when they wanted to screw the system, they were going climbing and surfing, and I think those same people now are, 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 are farming. So it's really inspirational, and I'm really thankful to have JM in town, and thankful for the work that he's doing. Um, welcome to town. Yeah, all right. Thanks, man. Uh, hanging out with Dan and Grace um, has been really awesome. And uh, this is my second time here. I came in last year, and I was really impressed by visiting the offices and the store and everything. I'm a big fan of the company. I'm a big fan of the values that the company is, is pushing. And uh, I'm a big fan of Yvonne. I think he's here somewhere. So yeah, big fan. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I get a bit nervous with these, but um, usually I come to talks and I talk about how to set up your farm, how to include permaculture principles at the design stage, how to lay out your beds, the size of your beds, standardizing your beds, how to inoculate your soil with good compost, how to not work your soil using brock forks and shallow cultivation, and how to make money with all these strategies. But today, I don't think I'm gonna focus on that because you guys are already have a career, I think, and you're, you're needed where you guys uh, are doing the work. Um, I was thinking perhaps more about presenting a bit of myself, my story, and really my journey of the last, I would say, eight years. And it's been a pretty kind of crazy, crazy ride for me, but I just feel that there's something pushing this. And um, I think I have a few cues about that, and that's what I'd like to pass down to you guys. So, small scale farming is making a comeback, big time. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of young people who want to get into farming, like Dan said. And there's also a lot of older farmers that are, they wanna get out, and there needs to be a match. And one of them, there's a lot of problems with, with farm and farming and young people into farming, but what I've observed and where I play a role is to there's, a, there's been a complete breakage of the lineage of how to get proper instruction on how to be a good grower. And you know, growing vegetables, to talk about that because that, that's where I'm an expert, you know, we're growing 40 to 60 different crops. We, we're not in California, so the climate is always changing and it's just you need to adapt. And it's just not easy. And the margins are really slim so you really need to be technical and you really need to know what you're doing. And unfortunately, there's not that many good places where you can get that kind of education. When I got started, and, and so, and the, the other message is that, you know, a farm doesn't need to be big to be profitable for you to make a good living. That's been the main message that I've been giving to, to the people that I've been meeting. And this is a picture of my home farm. So we, bought this in 2004 and it's a two acre prairie in the middle of which there was an old rabbit barn and we didn't have a lot of money so we bought a barn we lived in a teepee prior to that farming with hand tools and we bought this and we designed a really productive market garden using a lot of the permaculture principles that I had learned and really the biggest teacher that we had was this land constraint. This, there's no more land to expand. So for the last 15 years, we've been growing, growing, growing with this land limitation, figuring out new ways, better ways to optimize, to get more production without growing on more land. And this market garden was made with, you know, not a lot of expensive tools to start. There's not a lot of uh, expensive infrastructure there, yet we're able to make a good living because we sell everything directly. We're not working with volumes where the margins would be even short, slimmer. We're selling directly. We're getting the results immediately and we're, you know, in contact in a relationship with our customers. We have about 250 customers total that we grow for through farmer's market, through CSA and through restaurant sales. And we've been 
uh, we've been netting more than 150 Ks ever since you know, the last eight, eight to 10 years, which it has been enough for us to make you know, a decent uh, living. Not killing it, not you know, major salaries, but in farming, that's pretty good. Actually, in farming, if you're able to make 50, 60 grand at the end of your farming year, you're definitely one of the most successful farmers probably ever. And the fact that you're doing it on 1.5 acres of cultivated land is for a lot of people kind of like unheard of or not possible in their mind, but it is. And there were people doing it before me and we just kind of picked up on that, perhaps refined it, retooled it, and, and we were lucky enough to have the good parameters to really get it going. And, and so that's, that's what we've been doing. And uh, so we've been farming. This is, my, this is my wife, my girlfriend, Modelaine. She came in last year, but now she's, she wanted, she preferred actually to go skiing than to come to California. So it tells something about her. So we've been 15 years working that farm, an acre and a half. So it's really been sustainable also over all these years. Um, it's one hectare, so 1.5 acre. Uh, there's 40 different vegetables and 200 plus families that we feed. And we got to that point because when we, we, we were in our early, early 20s, we were, you know, we're environmentally aware. I studied ecology and environmental science at McGill University. That's where I met her. And we were basically studying ecological collapse for three years. And a lot of the jobs offer after that were like for working for Environmental Canada or something like that. And we're like, fuck that. It's not going to, this is not. And I come from the suburbs. I didn't grow up on a farm. She comes from the countryside, but there wasn't a lot of farming there. It was more logging. And, you know, agriculture was not in our cards. It, we weren't aware of it. It wasn't something that you even thought about. You know, I was skateboarding and snowboarding and doing all these stuff, hiking. But when we graduated, we made a trip and we went to Mexico. We worked on fair trade coffee farms there. Then we migrated up north to New Mexico, worked on earth ships building, uh, you know, uh, autonomous houses in the desert. And then we woofed, which is we volunteered on a small organic farm. And that was in Norton, New Mexico, Santa Fe. And one of the best grower there was French Canadian from Gaspésie and he had a really strong French accent and he was super happy to have us because we would kind of tell the same jokes together. And we learned with him, but it wasn't really the farming that we learned. It was how the farmer in that community was playing an impactful role and how he was, he was having a really good lifestyle because he was in beautiful abiquiu, farming there, beautiful light, working every day outside, picking vegetables, hard day, but good days when you feel good about working physically. And then he would come back and sell his produce at the farmer's market and people would line up, you know, big lineups to get salad from Richard. Richard was the salad king of Santa Fe. And we were young and, and we were working on the farm, really appreciating doing hands-on work, but also I was doing the cash box. And I was seeing how much cash Richard was making. I was like, fuck this guy, you know, he's making $3,000 cash in one morning. And for me, like, I, I was a ski lift operator during my university years, so we were making like $6 an hour. So all of these things, being outside uh, uh, and, and having him being popular and people would thank him also, like everybody would thank him for his work. And then seeing the, the money side, all of this kind of helped make sense of also what I was looking for was a way to create an impactful uh, life for me and to make a, a, a healthy planet Earth, how to restore planet Earth. And I was seeing all of this with my young eyes. So anyway, to make a long story short, we got into farming. We stayed there for a year and a half, and then we moved back to Quebec and started our own little project. So that's a picture of young me and young Modelaine farming. That was pre-Instagram. You see, this is all wilted. This is half empty. <laughs> We're growing squash, the easiest crop to grow. But we started with hand tools because that was kind of the model that we had seen. We were never interested in tractors. 
and it just wasn't the focus of our love for the land and for the work. And um, one of the, uh, before we bought our land, because we farm in Quebec and the winters are pretty harsh, and we, we lived in a teepee, so obviously that was a bad move because we had seen a young couple in New Mexico raising their kids in a teepee, and we thought, that's rad, let's just do it. <laughs> Long story short, it's a bit cold. So we traveled, <laughs> and we went to Cuba. And we stayed for a few months in Cuba, and Cuba at that time, it was a 10-year period, and we had studied that at the university, where they didn't have any fossil fuel on the island. And so anything that was petroleum-based, pesticides, fertilizers, uh, herbicides, fungicides, these are all petroleum-based products. They didn't have access to those, and they didn't have fuel to put in the tractors. So the government there reinvented the whole agriculture for it to be 100% organic, and for vegetable production, they were laying out these organoponicos, which were permanent raised beds, cement contoured, of crops that were heavily, uh, uh, densely seeded and heavily composted with, with good compost and vermicompost. And they had big programs about that. And for us, why would this was influential is because we were seeing acres and acres and acres of non-tractor cultivated fields. And the people working there were gardeners. And it was just like super productive. So that really caught our attention and that's what we kind of developed over time and so we have on the farm permanent raised bed systems we left out the cement because cement you know they, I think they were that was part of the economy there like to work cement because they had cement but and then we wor started working with hand tools but walk behind tractors and appropriate technology for smaller scale farming and um, over the years you know, we've found or, you know, now there's a small industry about hand tools and just like new things coming up with the internet, it really speeded up that process of finding good, good gear for small scale farming without tractors. And the fact that there's no tractor on the farm really allows you to optimize a lot of things. And today I don't have the time to really explain why and how. But when people come to my workshop, even growers that have been growing 30 years, like there was one really beautiful man that was there at the workshop, and he, I don't know then how long has he had been farming, but long time. Uh, Romeo? Yeah. Most yeah, and it's just like this beautiful farmer, and he was like, wow, just so many new things. Because when you leave out the tractor, you kind of look at it differently, and you can optimize more, and you intensify production. So anyway. A lot of new tools, a lot of strategy, using tarps to, to really uh, not work the soil. So we're really in a no-till farming system, you know, minimal tillage, relying on earthworms to do the work. We call it the biointensive method. So we're really intensifying production by having it, all the crops closely grouped, but we're relying on the ecology of the soil to sustain that production. So really interesting stuff. And then I wrote, after eight years doing this, you know, quite successfully, uh, I don't know if I grew tired of farming, but I just felt there was something more into me, so I wrote a book. And the book is available, you can check it out. It's a, it's a technical farming book, so it's not about philosophy or anything like that, but in that book, I just laid out uh, um, a, a guideline of how to successfully start run and optimize your small farm operation. And the book, I wrote it in French, it became really rapidly a bestseller in the hometown province of Quebec. 5,000 copies, that was huge at, the, at that time for that small market. Then it went to France, it became super popular there. Uh, still today, I'm probably the most renowned farmer in France, and I've, <laughs> I go there once a year, and that's it. But people have picked up the book, and that's the information that they wanted, and it's working. So it's just pa being passed down. Then, after touring a lot in France, uh, the book got translated in English. Then I went to English Canada, BC, Ontario, Alberta. 
did that. Then I came to the U.S. That was a big thing for me because, you know, we, I was living in a teepee not long ago and we were just kind of, you know, do, doing our homestead. And, and then the book really exploded. And now there's 150,000 copies sold. It's translated in eight languages, still coming up. And people from all over the world are reading the book and inviting me to talk about it and share my story. So the last five years, six years, my winters have been spent touring the world from, you know, pretty much all the states in the US to going to Australia, to New Zealand, to Germany, to France, to Croatia. I've been pretty much all over teaching workshops and getting the passage that, you know, there's something happening. And that's what I got out of all of this is that everywhere I go, a, people are interested, people are paying attention, they're respectful, and I meet so many beautiful young people, and not so young, I have to say that, that that's what they want to do. That's their passion, it's in their heart, and they feel the calling to leave their jobs, computer work, whatever, I don't want to overemphasize that, I'm pretty sure some of you guys work on computers, but do something else, something outside, something with their own boss. And when you show them that you can make a living and you don't need to have land, you don't need to have like uh, $200,000 in debt to start. It's a $40,000 project to start. And then, you know, you can, you, can, you can start. So anyway, people are stoked and I get to travel. Now I'm a bit tired of it, but I got to travel a lot. And what I got of it is that there's a huge demand and there's a huge need for knowledge about how to do this. And if you look at the history of the last 150 years, a lot of things that we do on our farms, that's how it was done before. It was done like that in California. It was done like that in France. Like the best growers were in France and the best growers were in California. And they were farming without tractors. And it was highly productive. But then the tractors came in and whatever happened, chemical farming, it just kind of got lost. But when you take out these old books, it's not too far away from what we do because it's all common sense. And the fact that you can sell directly to people that are aware, sens sensitive to eating good food is, is, was the missing, missing link perhaps in the last 30 years. Like the pioneers before me, they were really pushing this idea to people that, you know, healthy, organic produce was good for you and for your family. Now the message came out and like when I started farming, you know, there was a demand for what I did. So it's really good. And I hope this will really pick up even more. Five years ago, um, because of all the hype around my work and the book and blah, 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 uh, my mentor, Elliot Coleman, came to me a few times and said, you know, I'm doing some consulting work in Canada, it's actually in Montreal, not far from where you are, and this uh, rich businessman wants to do a regenerative farm, holistic farm, to demonstrate how farms could be like in the future. And he wants you to run it. And uh, I was kind of not sure about working for super wealthy people because I, I've been kind of autonomous and a rebel all of my life. But when we met together, me, me and, and, and the owner, it was just, he was a pretty radical dude. And I jumped on board and for two years, uh, I designed with a crew of permaculture designer, a 160 acre farm that was built from scratch, costed a lot of money, but very interesting things came out of that farm. A lot of, you know, we traveled the world looking at things and incorporated a lot of those. So there's a huge uh, market garden. Uh, there's cattle that are grass fed, rotational pastures, uh, chickens incorporated. A lot of the stuff that you see around. Joel Salatin is, is a friend of mine now and really helped in that way. Pastured pigs and a food lab that's there too. But for me, it's the market garden where I can now teach more people. And that was why I got interested in that project. Like I needed a space more than my 1.5 acre to teach people how to do this. And so I said yes to that. It was a big project. I'm still tired of it, meaning physically tired. But um, we're doing awesome, awesome stuff that 
I don't think is done anywhere else in the world. Perhaps in Japan or in Asia where I haven't been. But on this 10 acre market garden, we produced close to $700,000 of produce last year. And there's 10 of us working. And most of them are apprenticed. But everything is designed, streamlined, and we follow guidelines how to do things really the right way, and the best way, I think. And it's giving a lot of result. And so we did that train people for three years to do this and again permaculture was incorporated in a lot of the design stage uh, that's a buzzword permaculture some of you guys you know perhaps sometimes wonder if that farming and permaculture permaculture is about restoring habitats and creating them and they are perfect to surround farming systems but they're not they're not the same. You know, when you're farming, it's input productive and you want to have an output and you're producing. But to surround the farm with these principles, create habitats, is what we did. It's a beautiful space. Going fast here, because I, I hope I can answer some of your questions. Training these people uh, to become really good market gardeners, um, we filmed it. And I was approached to, and I kind of approached and was approached to document some of that. And it ended up being a 10 part, a one hour episode about from, you know, spring to late winter, what we do on the farm and showcasing the brilliance of our work, but also the brilliance of all these young people that are working with me and how enthusiastic and eager they are. And so this, this, is, this is the trailer for the show. It's in French, so it's going to be subtitled. So, I'm... I'm showing you this because it became primetime TV, like one of the most watched TV show. And it's really slow TV. There's no drama. There's no, nobody hooks up with anyone. It's really, we're, you know, we're putting up a caterpillar tunnel and saying, yeah, it's difficult. It's very windy. And for some reason, people have connected with it big time. And, you know, I'm here with Danny. Danny is one of the main characters in the show. And, Danny, for a little while, could not walk in the streets without people saying, hey, man, you're Danny from the show. And it's just, for me, it really opened up my mind and my eyes on how when we show this kind of farming, which is youthful and positive and brilliant and, and really the future of farming, that's what it is, you can really attract a lot of people to wanting that and to buying that. And so that for me was, was something really big that I'm, I'm still kind of like trying to trying to see what kind of power could be out there. At the same time uh, we were doing this, I also started to document some of the techniques. You know, I wrote my book in 2012, and already in 2015 and 16, I, I had learned a lot of new things, and I just felt that instead of writing another book, we should just film all these steps. You know, from, let's, carrots from, okay, we're starting them, how do we prepare the soil? The seeds, what kind of seeds, how do we seed them, which seeder, how to calibrate the seeder, how to cultivate them, how to not have weed, how to not have rust fly, how to harvest them, how to manipulate the carrots, how to bunch them, all of these details. There's a lot of things to know, how to market them afterward. And so started to film the whole process, really building for my farm and, and, and then to share it you know, an operating guideline of how to do things. And um, my friend Alex, who's filming, did that with me. And we just created an online course where people could have access to this information because I'm, I'm getting tired of traveling all around. And we did that. And, you know, farming is hard work. We started a little trailer. We put a so lot of that. hours. It's a big dedication of our time to do this every day, day in, day out. If I put myself in the shoes of people that are starting in farming, maybe their first year, second year, third year, whatever, you know, the first years are, are hard. 
because you're building your clientele, you're building your infrastructure, and also you're learning, you're making a lot of mistakes. If you are going to be successful in farming, you need to have that mindset where you're gonna be investing in the right tools, but it's the same thing for knowledge. After 15 years doing this, I've come down to this really important understanding that to have good techniques and good methods is the most important aspect of your farm. The Market Gardener's Masterclass is an online program showing all of the steps of all the things that I do on my farms every step of the way. Best practice, tested, trialed, ready to go, universal in many ways, many aspects, and it's also creating a community of like-minded growers from all over the world. Most of the tools that we recommend, there's discounts around them, and in the end, it just creates an ecosystem where the purpose is to help you become a better grower and further advance your farming. I want to help you in your farming so that you can have more success and you can have a better life. If I can be a part of that, I will, I will be a happy man. So, we launched that a year ago and the response was we had never expected that and it's a pretty pricey project because it's, it's taking a lot of effort and paying people to help do something of high quality but we got a thousand people in one year from 55 different countries signing to the class creating a network around the world of growers connecting with each other it's which really different from all the other networks because it's all mostly localized but now it's kind of global and and really again just sh telling me inspiring me or i don't know kind of telling me this message that this is this needs to happen there's a lot of people who want to do this and there's a big vacuum of knowledge of how to do this and so i have a message for you guys here and and that there's something strong happening and i'm on the forefront of this i'm with these young people I meet them, I see them, they cry with me, they're motivated, they want to see this for themselves, and they're feeding community healthy food. There's a big wave coming, and I think Patagonia could be a big part of that. And throughout my presentation, you've probably noticed that pictures are nice, videos are hopeful, it looks appealing, it's attractive. I've always been thinking that if we're going to be promoting something, it should be sexy, it should be made fun, and it should be telling the story that you can do it. And you can. You just need to know how. And I'm really sure that the future of farming will be regenerative agriculture, which will be ecological, profitable, nourishing, and human scale. So we're not talking about hydroponic farms. We're not talking about farms in the ocean and on the moon. Fuck that. <laughs> like, we just need to have more people wanting to farm profitably on small acreage. And we need to multiply that by millions and millions. And I think, that's my belief, that's the future of farming. And last year when we came, I was really impressed to, to talk with Ivan. He was telling me that what you guys are thinking about regenerative agriculture and how you can influence it. And I think that one of the way that Patagonia could do that would be to start putting pictures of young people farming. Just like you'd see a rock climber, because when you, some people look at the rock climber, they're like inspired by it, and then they want to do that too. But how about we start putting pictures of farmers that are feeding their community and showing their story and, tell, and showing the people how beautiful it is. I think it would inspire a whole generation of people to say, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's my hero. I want to be like JM. That's what I want to be. And I think this will go a long way into helping create the buzz. And when there's demand for something, then universities will have to, you know, they're not going to be, they're not going to let me do the master class forever. They wanna, they're, they're going to want to have a piece of the pie also. So they're going to adapt. And, but there needs to be this initial kind of surge of we want to do this and we want this. Yeah. So anyway, 
these are my thoughts, and if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. This is all my social media stuff, and yeah, thank you. Thank you for your attention.